Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Mary and Greg and I are just delighted to be with you this morning. We really wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Mary, we're about to, study, to, to start studying this lesson, so will you pray for God's blessing on this Yes, most study? definitely. Our kind, gracious, and loving Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for another Sabbath morning, another opportunity to come and worship you Amen. through the study of your word, but we dare not do it without asking for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be with each and every one of us, those, who, those of us who are leading, as well as everyone else, Amen. Lord, who is attending virtually. And we pray that your angels be with each and every one of us, that you would open our hearts and minds to your truth, and that we may be able to absorb this into our lives Amen. and to be able to share it with those around us. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. This week's Sabbath School lesson is titled Extreme Heat. And I hope that you've had an opportunity to actually read through it, maybe even study through it. This is an incredible lesson, incredible lesson for us to assimilate for us to study. And what uh, Mary and Greg and I will be doing this, this morning is, is to go through each day's lesson and to explore it, to explain it the best we can. The memory verse, the memory text, is found in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10. And it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And that him has a capital H. It says to me that the Lord was pleased that the Lord was going to be bruised, mm -hmm. our Lord Jesus Christ. He has put him to grief, says the verse. When you make his soul an offering for sin, you shall see his seed. He shall prolong his day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So, very briefly, what is this verse really telling us? First of all, it doesn't really say that the Lord was delighted that Jesus, the Messiah, should suffer. That's not what it says. Because when you go to Isaiah chapter 52, and you read verses 13, it really says that the Lord was not delighted that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to suffer. But in view of the eternal welfare of mankind, a sinful status in which we find ourselves, and the security of the whole universe because of our sin, the whole universe is at stake. Um, it was best for Christ to suffer. Thus, it pleased the Lord in the sense that it was the will of the Lord that this was the only way the plan of salvation could succeed. Then the verse says, when you make his soul an offering for sin. Profound statement in this particular verse. What it really says is that Christ's life became a trespass offering. In other words, the death of Christ provided an acceptable and effective atonement for sin. This sacrifice was essential for our redemption and restoration. And this is important. And so the verse then uh, ends by, by expressing some great, great feelings. He shall see seed. God is going to see his people. Then he says, he shall prolong his days. He's going to take time to come back so that as many of his seed can be saved. Then he says, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. This is a complete successful mission that the Messiah is going to take place. What a verse. And so I just wanted to unpack that a little bit for you and for me today. Here's a brief uh, overview of uh, this week's Sabbath School lesson. Joy Lewis. So who's Joy Lewis? Now, Joy Lewis, the wife of the famous Christian writer, C.S. Lewis was dying. Because of the pain C.S. Lewis experienced as he watched his wife dying, he found himself tempted to redefine 
who God was. So he wrote, and I'm going to quote from a grief observed, that's a New York HarperCollins publish, uh, publishing book published in 1961 and written from, uh, by C.S. Lewis. So pages six and seven, here's how C.S. Lewis writes. Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about Him. The conclusion I dread is not so there's no God after all, but so is this what God is really like? Suffering? Pain? Many of us, because of our pain, our hurt, and our suffering, experience the same temptation to redefine God when things become really painful. Some of us reject God completely. For others, like C.S. Lewis, there is the temptation to change our view of God and imagine all sorts of bad things about God. In so doing, when we do that, we may totally miss that God is at work for us, that He is by our side, and that He loves us unconditionally. The question is, just how hot can it get? How much heat is God willing to risk putting His people, you and I, through it, in order to bring about His ultimate purpose of shaping us into the image of Christ? That's the purpose of the crucible, is a character change that reflects Christ. This week's lesson focuses on several biblical examples that will help us understand further the whys of suffering and the hows of overcoming evil and suffering. The example of Abraham's readiness to sacrifice his own son in obedience to God teaches us an unreserved trust in God even when God's command do not make sense. Hosea's painful relationship with his unfaithful wife reveals God's own suffering caused by our unfaithfulness. Job's resolute loyalty to God, Job's resolute, uh, resolute loyalty to God, even when his, his own wife and his best friends called him to curse God, teaches us that avoiding suffering and death is not the ultimate goal in life. Together with Job, Paul teaches us that love and faithfulness to God, faithfulness to his kingdom, faithfulness to his mission in the world is the most fulfilling experience of Christian life. Of course, there are things that you and I do not understand. But you know, the Christian goes through suffering and death armed, or should go through suffering and death armed with the Apostle Paul's view on the struggle as he expresses it in Romans chapter 8, verses 35, where he asks us the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who has the power and the ability to separate us from the love of Christ? And then he, goes, he finishes the sentence by saying, shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, death itself? In other words, can anything or anyone put a distance between us and Christian love? Can anyone could cause Christ to stop loving you and loving me? All the things that Paul listed on verse 35 will not make Christ love us any less than what he does. God truly loves us unconditionally. This week's lesson highlights two major themes. The first theme will engage us in a profound study of revelation examples of suffering that will help us understand why God allows suffering in our experience. The second theme we will learn from the story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. How a father and son survived their crucibles and how much they learn and grow through these experiences. Mary, 
Talk about and explain Abraham's crucible to us. Mary, talk about and explain Abraham's crucible to us. Oh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the beautiful overview of the week that you gave us, Victor. And today, today's lesson focuses on Abraham's promised son and the unfathomable call to sacrifice this beloved son, Amen. a sacrifice that perhaps only God himself could understand. In terms of heat, right, we're studying extreme heat, this certainly seems very intense and very extreme. I'd like to remind us before we move on that a crucible can also mean a place or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. Right. So let's keep this in mind as we study today's lesson. Let's read the story in Genesis 22, verses 1 to 3. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Why did God issue such a difficult command? Was it a test for God's understanding or for Abraham's or perhaps for the unlooking universe? Remember, Abraham had already tried to fix the infertility issue by fathering Ishmael and thereby demonstrated a lack of faith in God's ability to fulfill his promise. Was this God's way of further purifying Abraham's character? removing the last vestiges of selfishness and self-reliance? Well, verse 1 says God tested Abraham. Why did God have to test him? Well, we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets that God called Abraham to be the father of the faithful. His life was to stand as an example of faith to succeeding generations. But he had shown distrust of God in the past by concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife and by his marriage to Hagar. In that book, page 146, we read, but his faith had not been perfect. That he might reach the highest standard, God subjected him to another test, the closest which man has, was ever called to endure. And I want us to notice what was God's goal and intention? That he might reach the highest standard. Was God actively involved in character development? Yes, he's endeavoring to influence a positive change in Abraham's character. That's the ultimate goal. So as we continue with the story, Abraham, Isaac, and the two servants load up a donkey with wood and head off to the land of Moriah. When they arrive at the location, only father and son head up the mount. And then Isaac asks his father about the lamb. We'll pick up Abraham's response in verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God now intervenes. He stops Abraham, and the test is over. Amen. 
So let's analyze this passage and identify multiple purposes for this trial. God first tested Abraham's fidelity and obedience. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 155, we read, Heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon Adam and Eve involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. God declared to his servant, Now I know that you fear God, notwithstanding Satan's charges, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Secondly, this test had a threefold purpose a revelation of God's plan of salvation, a prophecy of Jesus' substitutionary death, and a typology of God the Father and Jesus' roles in the sacrifice of the plan of salvation. God wanted to teach Abraham and the entire world about God's own sacrifice of his son for us in John 3.16, we read that. In the Desire of Ages, we also read that Abraham had greatly desired to see the promised Savior, and he saw Christ. Jesus says that in John 8, 56. He was given a view of the divine sacrifice for sin. Of this sacrifice, he now had an illustration in his own experience. So this terrible ordeal was imposed upon Abraham that he might see the day of Christ, and realize the great love of God for the world. Another purpose for the test was so that God could impress upon Abraham's mind the reality of the gospel. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. Another important aspect of this experience is Isaac's own participation and reaction to this event. While we focus on Abraham's anguish and suffering, we need to point out that this experience was Isaac's crucible too. He could have reacted in many ways, such as dubbing his father a mad old man or running away, but Isaac did not do so. His upbringing in faithfulness and in trusting God and his father makes Isaac a perfect example for the Christian going through crucibles. In Youth Instructor, we read that father and son build the altar, and the terrible moment comes for Abraham to make known to Isaac that which has agonized his soul during that long journey of three days, that Isaac himself is the victim. Isaac is a full-grown young man, about 20 years old at this point. He could refuse to submit to his father's design, but he does not even sink, seek to change his purpose. He submits and he believes in the love of his father. This lesson highlights the great act of faith displayed by Abraham in the extreme heat of this crucible. He didn't seek excuses to avoid obeying God, his genuine faith was manifested in confidence and obedience. I'd like to finish with one other quote, and this says, God has always tried his people in the furnace of affliction in order to prove them firm and true and purge them from all unrighteousness. After Abraham and his son had borne the severest test that could be imposed upon them, God spoke through his angel unto Abraham. Now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. This great act of faith causes the character of Abraham to shine forth with me remarkable luster. It forcibly illustrates his perfect confidence in the Lord from whom he withheld nothing, not even his son by promise. As we go through our crucibles in life, 
may we also prove to be firm, true, and act in perfect confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, Mary. It, it, you know, Greg and Mary, it's incredible how faith, deep rooted faith, sustains obedience throughout whatever Amen. goes through. Amen. And Abraham Amen. And, and Isaac are a great picture of a faithfulness and obedience. obedience. Amen. Amen. Greg, what does the story of Hosea reveal about God to us? Well, I, I certainly learned a lot and it just got me to reflect not only about wayward Israel, but spiritual Israel, us today. So good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to you. Uh, Monday's lesson is titled Wayward Israel. So today we're going to look at Wayward Israel, but with a perspective from the book of Hosea. And it has some powerful examples for us to take to heart. And the word Hosea, Joshua, Jesus are all derived from the same Hebrew root word, Yasha, meaning salvation. And he, Hosea, he ministers to the northern kingdom of Israel, which is also referred to as Ephraim because it's the largest of the tribes. And outwardly, the nation is enjoying a time of prosperity and growth. However, inwardly, moral corruption and spiritual adultery has permeated throughout Israel. So Hosea is called out by God to prophesy during Israel's last hours, just as Jeremiah will prophesy years later to the crumbling kingdom of Judah. So as you know, Hosea is instructed by God to marry a woman, a harlot by the name of Gomer. And he finds that his domestic life accurately and parallels very, very closely and reflects the unfortunate and tragic unfaithfulness of God's people. So during his, it was nearly a half century, 40 to 50 years of ministry, Hosea repeatedly echoes a threefold message. One is that God abhors the sins of his people. Not the people, but the sins. Judgment is certain if they don't turn from their ways. But three, most importantly as well, is God's loyal love stands firm. So as God's messenger, Hosea offers a possibility of salvation if only the nation will turn from idolatry back to God. So the question is, what is God willing to do to help bring back Israel, not only ancient Israel, but us today from the brink of our own destruction? So we're going to look at Hosea chapter 2, and we're going to start with verses 2, and we're going to go through 10. So verses 2 through 3, we're going to break this up in segments here states, bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between, from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst." So God, what he's doing is he's warning his people, his chosen people, by leaving them empty and void of him, of his presence, unless they put away their harlotries and adulteries. Let's now move on to verses 5 through 7. For their mother has played the harlot. She who can see them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up for your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers but not overthrow them. Yes, she will seek them but not find them. Then she will say, I will go back and return to my first husband. For then it was better for me than now. So God is telling the Israelites that if they continue in their harlotry, in their spiritual adulterous ways, he is willing to put obstacles in their path, even thorns and walls that may affect their ways in their efforts, and for them to recognize the destructive results of their choices so that they will turn from their ways and return to her first husband, God, for his ways are better for them, and we know that. Verses 8 through 9, 
for she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season, and I will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. So all the blessings they took for granted, God is willing to take those away because those things that he gave them, they are taking and giving credit to and worshiping Baal. How sad is that? They forgot who the giver of blessings is. Are we guilty of doing the same thing today? I think so. We're really no different. And then let's conclude with verse 10. Now, when I uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. So God is willing to reveal Israel's lewdness, her sinfulness, in her iniquity in front of her and her false lovers. And the false lovers are false gods. So like Baal, there is no other type of God that she can play the harlot to that will help her. Only God will help her. So these stories, they raise really two key issues about the way that we experience God when he is trying to lead us to repentance. And first is we risk not recognizing that God is at work, working for our salvation. That's so powerful. God is willing to work with us, his long suffering for our salvation, our benefit. When we go through hard experiences and we feel like our path is blocked or surrounded by walls or thorns, whatever we are feeling or whatever we're going through, God is always working to bring us to repentance. Why? Very simple. We quote this verse so many times. Maybe it's me. Maybe it just touches my heart. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that he whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But also need to keep in mind Revelation 3.19. God says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. He's pleading with us. He, ple he was pleading with ancient Israel. He's pleading with us today. The second thing, the second issue is we risk misunderstanding God when he is at work. We may feel hurt. We may feel angry. We may be upset, embarrassed. And it's easy from our perspective to blame God. Why is God not caring enough? Why is he not intervening to our expectations? But the question is, did he make our bad decisions or choices? No. Most often it's the result of our own destructive free will choices that we make and to get us back on the path of righteousness, God may allow us to go through some heat, perhaps even some extreme heat as we'll discuss in Thursday's lesson. But know this, God is always trying to renew us all. And that goes not only for wayward Israel from years ago, but also for us today, spiritual Israel. And that's through his love, his covenant of love and grace and mercy. Amen. Thanks so much, Greg. What, what a picture of a God that loves unconditionally. Amen. He will do anything to have you and I saved. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Amen. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, I hope that you, you, you know, you, you, you can actually see how the crucibles that um, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Osea went through um, really reflect faithfulness obedience, love, and how we should react as we experience those. Tuesday's lesson, of course, talks about surviving through worship. And when I think of significant extreme suffering in the Bible, my mind immediately turns to Job. Mm -hmm. If any human being suffered, Job did. And Amen. Job suffered significantly. Amen. Most of us have read and know Job's story. You know, I grew up with it as a kid, and if you grew up in, in a church, you invariably know Job's story. But do you remember how the story began? Well, I'm going to take you through, um, through the first uh, few verses of Job chapter 1, 
so that we can rekindle this story and, and, uh, and be acquainted with it. So let's read uh, first, uh, verses 6 and 7 of Job, number, Job 1. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. This is, uh, by definition, a, a very interesting statement. It's mm. profound, and I don't have time to really explain. But the sons of God came and, uh, before, before the Lord. And the verse goes on and says, And Satan also came among them. And then verse 7 says, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? You almost have this sort of a situation. I'm not expecting you here. Where do you come from? What are you doing here with us? And then, and then it says, So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Ooh, the sentence is pregnant with theological meaning. Satan's really saying to the Lord, Look, I represent the earth, and I have the right to be here with you. All right. So we see in, in these two verses, we see here, that the sons of God came to see God, that Satan came along with them, and we see God interacting with Satan. So then, as Job chapter 1 verses 8 tells us, then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on, on the earth, a blameless, an upright man, one who fears God and shuts or shuns evil? Notice carefully, it wasn't Satan who brought Job to God's attention. It was God who looked at Satan and pointed to Job and asked him, Have you considered my servant Job? So Satan responded and tells God, as we read in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1, Does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, have you not made a hedge around him? around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Then Satan goes on to say, as we read in verse 11 of chapter 1, But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And what's God's response to that challenge? So God responds in verse 12 and says to Satan, Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. You may do anything to all that he has. Only do not lay hand on his person. You cannot destroy his life. You cannot kill him. As we continue to read the, uh, the, the remainder of chapter 1, as well as chapter 2 of Job, we notice that Job has absolutely no idea how hot his crucible about to become. How hot is his crucible about to become. We see that it is Satan, not God, who causes Job's suffering. And it becomes clear that it is God who gives his explicit permission for Satan to destroy Job's possessions, children, and his own physical health. And if you recall, if you have read the story, you know that oxen and donkeys got stolen by Sabean bandits. You know that fire destroyed his sheep. We know that the Chaldean party rides off with Job's camels. We know that Job receives devastating news that holy sons and daughters had perished during a party at their oldest brother's house. We know that Job, Job is struck with painful boils, and eventually his wife and his best friends, were not a, which, which were not exactly helpful, counsel Job to curse God and die. So the question that I have for you and for me is, how can God be righteous and holy when he, he actively allows Satan to cause, cause Job such pain? In this situation, a special case, or is, is, is it characteristic of the way God still deals with us today? 
This, of course, is an important question to ask. And so how did Job respond to these trials? You see, it is possible to respond to such suffering in two ways. We can become bitter and angry. We can turn our backs on God because we believe that He is cruel and non-existent. Or we can hang on to God more tightly. These are two ways to react. We do know that despite multiple attacks from Satan, Job did not curse the Lord. In the contrary, Job remained faithful to the very hand. Job stayed in God's presence and worshipped Him. In fact, verse 20 of Job chapter 1 tells us that Job arose in humility and shamefulness, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground onto his knees and worshipped him. When the crucible was very hot, Job did not stop worshipping his God. One of the first things many people do when they experience pain is to stop to attend church. They don't come to church anymore. Why bother, they say, when God appears and interested in removing our pain, our suffering, why should I come to church? Job worshiped God and at extreme heat. Job maintained, Job maintained his belief in the goodness of God by determining to worship God in spite of his circumstances. You see, in Job chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 21, we see three aspects of worship that may help when we find ourselves in pain, maybe suffering, or even hurting. Let's look at these. One verse, verse 21. First sentence. The first sentence, Job accepts his helplessness and recognizes that he has no claim to anything. Let's read that sentence. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. So Job understands that what he has was gift. He didn't really earn any of that. Then the second aspect of worship that we may really understand and learn from this experience is the middle sentence on verse 21 of chapter 1 of Job. It says that the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. So anything that I have had, God has given it to me. And if God chose to take it away, then I'm going to continue to trust Him. And then finally, in that verse, there's a last sentence that is so powerful. Third, Job concludes by reasserting his belief in the righteousness of God. And he, he, he writes it and he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know what he tells me? Blessed be the name of the Lord when I come to this world and He gives me what I have. Blessed be the name of the Lord when He thinks that I should not have what I've got. Blessed be the name of the Lord when He thinks that my life has come to an end. Blessed be the name of the Lord because all that matters is when I live in the name of the Lord and for His purpose. Whatever the pressures, the difficulties, the sufferings. Job knew that his help and strength would be found in his knees before his Father, our God. And I hope that you and I can learn from that every day. When we go through the crucible, worship God, fall on your knees, and embrace Him. You know, as a result of Job's faithfulness, he has inspired and encouraged millions of God's children for thousands of years to be faithful, to be trustworthy, and to totally depend on God for His blessings. Mary, talk to us about surviving through hope. Yes, now we're going to look at an individual in the New Testament. And we're going to be looking at Paul's experience through extreme heat while preaching to the Corinthians and how he survived through hope. 
Paul was one of God's chosen messengers of the gospel to the world, and he endured more suffering than most other people in the scriptures. Yet he was not crushed. Instead of being discouraged, depressed, and disheartened, something else happened. Let's read 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, Amen. that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Amen. There's a lot in this. But what is Paul saying in these verses? He's informing the brethren first that they were burdened beyond measure, right. burdened above strength, right. beyond what strength could endure, to the point where they despaired of life, and they believed they had the death sentence. But in verse 9, Paul states why all this had come upon them. So they would not trust in self, but instead trust in God who raises the dead. He makes sure to mention that. They're learning the precious lesson of trusting in God and distrust of self. Their hope must be God-focused. So let's read a little more about Paul's hardships in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. So we get an idea of what he went through. Mm -hmm. He said, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. So 39 stripes, five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Right. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. What a list of hardships Absolutely. Wow. that Paul experienced for preaching the gospel of salvation. Most of us would sink into despair and probably give up with just one of those experiences. Right. But what does Paul do instead? Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11, but we're just going to read a couple of the verses there. So despite all his hardships, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, right, we're suffering a lot because of Christ, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. In verse 7, it says, And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. And then in verse 9, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given. Paul's response to all his tribulations is continued praise to God. Mm -hmm. He blesses God. He calls him the father of mercies and comfort of 
and God of all comfort. He declares that God comforts them so that they may comfort those who are in trouble. God abounds in providing them with consolation through Christ. God provides Paul with hope for the Corinthians during their sufferings, yep. that God will comfort and, con and console them. To trust in God who raises the dead and who ultimately delivers from death. And finally in verse 11, that thanks may be given at all times. Through all his sufferings, Paul continually praises God. Is there a lesson for us here? How do we react to trials in our lives? Do we sink into self-pity? Or do we seek to praise God for the hope he gives us? Are we sure of God's comfort and consolation and praise him for it? Do we seek to comfort others as they experience the same trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. God wants to work through us to minister to hurting people, which means God might allow us to experience the same pain so that we can offer encouragement and comfort, not from theory, but from our own experience. I'd like to conclude with a passage from <clears throat> Testimonies for the Church. Mm -hmm. If in the providence of God we are called upon to endure trials, let us accept the cross and drink the bitter cup, Amen. remembering that it is a Father's hand that holds it to our lips. <laughs> let us trust him in the darkness as well as in the day. Can we not believe that he will give us everything that is for our good? Even in the night of affliction, how can we refuse to lift heart and voice in grateful praise when we remember the love to us expressed by the cross of Calvary? Amen. God wants us to learn to trust in him and hope in him in all of our crucibles of our life. Romans 8.18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And in Romans 8, 28, Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, Amen. to those who are the called according to his purpose. And as Paul said, even if death is our experience, remember to hope and trust God, who will ultimately raise the dead and give us eternal life Amen. with him. Thank you so much, Mary. What an incredible, what an incredible life where he could say at the end, for I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And he's really saying, I understand what Christ has gone through for me and what a privilege it is for me to be able to be a vassal in which God exists and be simulated like Christ through my journey. Because it's not about suffering. It's about the transformation of my character and becoming like Christ. Tremendous. Greg, um, Thursday's lesson is obviously very interesting. And in our journey, we will probably experience uh, extreme heat from time to time. Why would God allow that? question, Victor. Well, as Victor had mentioned, Thursday's lesson is entitled Extreme Heat. And I'm quite sure each of us have experienced some heat before, perhaps even some extreme heat in our Christian walk. And perhaps some have experienced even more so than others, as in the case of Job that Victor spoke about. So what could be the reasons as to why we would experience extreme heat? I'm going to share three reasons why in, in my research for, for today's lesson, the three reasons that Scripture really talks to me about why we experience this extreme heat. And the first one is our willful separation from God. If we choose to walk away from Him and His protection and His provision, then we're likely to experience the results or consequences of doing so. Not because God wants to inflict heat upon us as a form of punishment, 
Rather, he allows the consequences of our choices to play out and manifest themselves as he withdraws his blessings. And we see this all through scripture with ancient Israel, and we can also see that in our lives today. So why does God allow this heat or extreme heat or more even commonly known as the refiner's fire that we go through. If we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is so long-suffering and patient with us. He wants us to be in his kingdom, and he's willing to do whatever he can to get us there. It's our stubbornness, our stiff-neckedness like ancient Israel, that God is wrestling with. So let's look at the second reason. We may be harboring sin or hanging on to attributes of our character that God knows must be dealt with, and if not, that sin or those traits could prevent us from entering his kingdom. Think of so many examples in scripture. Think of Nebuchadnezzar and his pride, what he had to go through, seven years in the wilderness, eating grass. So there's example after example in scripture that deals with these situations. And the third one I want to touch on is this. And this really hits on the point that Victor was going over in the story of Job. We have to remember an enemy has done this. In Matthew 13, verse 28, it's the parable of the wheat and tares. Jesus tells us that an enemy has done this. God is not the source of evil. He's not the source of evil thoughts, words, actions, or situations. We live in a fallen, sinful world. And the enemy is the source that does this with or without our awareness depending upon what we listen to, depending upon what we watch, depending upon we asso who we associate with. The enemy knows our weaknesses and he is the source of constantly introducing and tempting us with sin. He can't make us sin, but he can tempt us to sin. But God, however, in his love for us, he reveals the sins that are within us and our bad choices and our character flaws. Or simply, we could be going through a bad situation and that bad situation is something that is going on behind the scenes. It's spiritual warfare, such as what went on with Job. That's the clearest, best example in Scripture of spiritual warfare. We have to remember that the enemy is on the war path to see our fall, to pull us away from the Lord, to take away our salvation. And we have to remember that Satan is acting as a roaring lion. In 1 Peter 5 verse 8, God says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom may, he may devour. But know that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us if we cling to him. That is key. We have to cling to him. And in each of the aforementioned examples that we went through, when we experience this heat or this extreme heat of the refiner's fire, this is not God wanting to inflict pain. Even though the situation may be very painful, God is helping to separate us from sin and the source of sin. Unfortunately, some people may incorrectly conclude that God is severe and a demanding taskmaster. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is always working on us, leading us to repentance for the gift of salvation. Others may also expect that God should protect his people from these hurtful and harmful situations and dangers and that he would guide them along an easier route. And you know what? Sometimes God does in his grace and mercy. Sometimes he does. But remember, there is a spiritual battle going on behind the scenes. So sometimes it may be our own sin. It may be a bad choice. 
It may be a bad situation that happens to us, but just remember there is a spiritual battle that's going on for our hearts and our minds. It's our choice as to whether we want to cling to Jesus or not. God may not always help us to avoid the extreme heat. Rather, what he does is he helps us through it. That's so important. The extreme heat is not meant to destroy us, but it is to destroy the source of sin within us. And the extreme heat, this refiner's fire, it's not meant to make us miserable, but it's meant to purify our hearts, our minds, and our characters for his kingdom. And we can take these words, we're going to read a few verses here in closing, that we can take these words of God to heart to give us comfort as we go through heat or extreme heat in our Christian walk. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. That is so powerful. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. And I love this part too. This is what God is telling us. He's reaching out to everybody. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Thank God for that. And in finishing this lesson, I just want to leave you with these few verses. And these are comforting verses that the Lord gives us in Psalm 23, verses 1 through 4. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and your long-suffering and your love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Greg and Mary, thank you so much for, uh, for being part of this lesson. You, you know, I have grown immensely by, by what you've shared today and it's biblical. I cannot but forget what uh, the Apostle Paul, and we were talking about the Apostle Paul, wrote in 2 Corinthians. We were studying 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 4, verses 18, he says, I know this is not, a, this is not on, on, on the screen. While we do not look at things which are seen. In other words, don't look at the things that are seen. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are not seen, uh, for the things that are seen are temporary. It's, it's, this is temporary. Amen. This is a temporary Amen. journey. Amen. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. And that's so powerful. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this week's lesson. I certainly have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, I have thanked the Lord immensely by the opportunity that he's given me to actually research and study and study for me. And so um, I've got a, f a few final thoughts and an appeal that I want to make. And, um, and I, I, want to, uh, I want to start by really reviewing a little bit this lesson. When the crucible was very hot, Job did not stop worshiping our God. Whatever the pressures, Job knew that his help and strength would be found on his knees before God. I hope that that is a commitment you're going to make. When the crucible was very hot, Joseph kept looking up. Joseph kept looking up. Ellen White 
in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 214, tells us that Joseph didn't buckle because he saw, thrilled with a high resolve to prove himself true to God, and that all circumstances to act as he was a subject of the kingdom of heaven. He was committed to live as if he was with God in the presence of God. When the crucible was very hot, Abraham didn't stop obeying. Abraham did not lose his nerve because he personally knew the voice of God. He knew God was and was not tempted to believe that what he, that it was the devil or maybe his imagination that was asking him to, to sacrifice his son. So when God spoke, Abraham replied, Here I am. When the crucible was very hot, Paul did not forget that God was still sovereign, still ruler of the universe. See, the Apostle Paul kept on going and the great personal suffering, as you heard from Mary, through the years, because he was convinced as he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 28, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And He meant in all things, when it hurts, when there's pain, when there's suffering, in all things, when there's joy and there's happiness, happiness, it works for good for those who love Him. In contrast, when the crucible was very hot, God's people, Israel, failed to repent. Unlike Job, Joseph, Abraham, Paul, Israel failed to do what they needed to do when the heat of the crucible increased. You see, the cry of God's heart is always for His people to return to Him. God is calling you and He's calling me today to repent our ways and love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And here is God's call to you and to me through the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 30 to 32. And it says, this is God speaking, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, I will judge you. Everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. And then God says, Repent and turn from your transgression, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Verse 31, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, asks God. For why should you die, O house of Israel? And he's talking about a permanent death. Victor, why should you die? John, why should you die? Pauline, why should you die? That's the question. For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says God. This is verses 32. Therefore, turn and live, says God. Wonderful, wonderful promise of Scripture. You see, when the heat rises in the crucible, it might well be the time for God's people, for you and for me, to examine our loyalty with God. You see, God is at work for each one of us. We are the most precious possession He has. He came to this world and died for you and for me that we may be saved. The intense heat and his crucible, in his crucible, is a sign, not of his intense disapproval toward us, but of his intense displeasure at the sin that wraps our ability to reflect his goodness, to change our character, to be holy and to love. For that reason, his crucibles may often need to be hot. 
my prayer for you and for me today is that we understand that God is all love. All He wants is for you and for me to transform our characters while journeying to the New Jerusalem so we may reflect our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, open my eyes, open our eyes, O Lord, so we may see your love at all times. Strengthen our faith, God, that we may trust you even when it seems just impossible. O Lord, we seek to be more like you. Purify our hearts so you may dwell in us, that the life of Jesus may be manifest of our, on our mortal flesh. Anoint us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit, and prepare us for your soon coming. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a wonderful Sabbath. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.